Today, our topic is intrepid faith. Our attention is going to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. If you have a Bible, you can open it to that passage. I want to read it, uh, then talk about the big idea that is derived from it. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. I've been a pastor now for 25 years. I know it's hard to believe I look so young and uh, so fresh. Uh, But I just had my second daughter graduate from college yesterday. My my youngest is going to be a senior in, in high school. And I'm saying all of this so that you'll be convinced that I'm actually older than I look. But... um, I remember when I was a young pastor, just been a pastor for a few years, and an older pastor gave me a piece of advice. He said, young man, preach on faith. Talk about faith at least once every month. Faith is the key. Now, like a lot of good advice we received, I haven't done what he said. (laughs) On the other hand, I've never forgotten his words or how important, how how truly important faith is. One way of looking at your entire life is as a journey of faith. You're slowly but surely learning to trust, to trust God uh, with your family, to trust God with your church, uh, to trust God with your life, to trust him with everything. And once you have complete, uh, total faith in God, you say, shoot, I should have been trusting him all along. I I mean, it feels so good to get there, but it's not easy to get there. And this weekend, I'm adding a modifying word, intrepid, which is a word that's strong in its own right. Faith, as a word, might be a little tired. Uh, Intrepid is pretty fresh. Probably the best way to understand this word is by its synonyms. Intrepid means Fearless, bold, courageous, valiant, heroic, daring, gallant, resolute, audacious, plucky, dauntless, brave. I think when God asks you to walk by faith, this is what he means. He he wants you to step out bravely and boldly. He wants you to be intrepid. Now, the word intrepid has always had a special place in my heart because my grandfather was killed by a kamikaze on a ship by that name. I remember as a young boy being given a a model of this ship, Intrepid, and being told the story of my uh, grandfather. Uh, The carrier has had a storied career. It was in World War II in the Pacific served in Vietnam, uh, and then later was a retrieval vessel for many of the NASA missions. Here's a photo, actually, of the Intrepid underway. This photo was taken in the 1970s. Now it's a floating Navy air and space museum. It's harbored in New York City on the Hudson side. If you ever go to New York, it's an awesome museum. Here's a picture taken from the dock in New York City. This is the profile of the ship, a huge V, you know, rising up out of the water. It's, it's just a pretty cool sight to see. Uh, New Yorkers raised money to renovate this ship, $30 million to give it a makeover here in the last few years. It was actually in the news this past week. I don't know if any of you caught this, but one of the retired space shuttles is being placed on the Intrepid. And here's a picture of the shuttle being lifted off a barge I think this was taken on Thursday this week and put on the deck. And a second picture, uh, actually having the shuttle be put in position 
on the deck. It was on that deck that my dad's dad was killed, November 25th, 1944. In fact, my, my grandmother and my dad and his sister were all sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner when they got the news that my grandfather had been killed that day. I'm proud of my grandfather. One of the reasons is he volunteered. He was actually an older person when he entered the Navy, and he had been the manager of a Montgomery Ward store in Beatrice, Nebraska. Had a little bit older family, actually, and signed up. And he was a radio operator. So when the kamikazes hit the deck, he was on deck. He was right there. But I'm proud of my grandfather, I guess, because, you know, he enlisted. And, and in a weird way, I don't know if this is right, but I'm proud of this ship. <laughs> I don't know if it's proud, good to be proud of inanimate objects, but, you know, this ship has been attacked multiple times, hauled in for service multiple times. It keeps going back out. Kind of like some people I know. You know, I'd call them intrepid believers, a number of whom are, are actually profiled for us in Hebrews 11, and we're going to look at a couple of them this morning. But first, let me suggest that intrepid faith is the best way to live. I mean, to live this life where you're bold, <laughs> where you're plucky, <laughs> where you're dauntless, where you're brave. I mean, some of us aren't living that life. I mean, we're living a more timid life. But I'd say this, the risk-free life is a victory-free life. It means that you're going to have a lifelong surrender to the mediocre, and that's the worst of all defeats. To say, my life's just going to be mediocre. Not going to rise to anything. I'd say the intrepid life is the life to live. And there's three basic personality types that are doomed to failure here. First of all, the historians. Historians are people who really live out of the past. They, they stay focused on the past. They're, they're concerned about how things could have been, how things should have been. I mean, they're not even in the present. They're still back there. They don't live an intrepid life. Second, the settlers. These are people who are really focused on the present. They do get into the present, but their whole focus is on keeping the current conditions the same. <laughs> how, how do we not see change how do we just protect ourselves? And then there are the dreamers. Dreamers are people who think about the future, but they never really turn their plans into action. I mean, a lot of us in this room, we have dreams. But they're not becoming actionable items. They're things we're thinking about. We might even think a lot about it. But that's not faith. Faith is belief times action. Faith is an action word. In fact, when you read Hebrews chapter 11, you see how people, one after the other, are taking action in their life. I mean, they truly believe. They have that belief in their heart, but it's getting to their feet too. They're moving out. They are doing something. I'd say what historians and settlers and dreamers have in common is they don't do anything. They're thinking about the past, they're thinking about the present, they're thinking about the future. They're not going anywhere. But really, faith is motives, but it's also motation. I mean, it's actually moving. It's a vision, but it's what some sociologists have called a vision act. That you actually take an action based on that vision, and you go forward in faith. C.T. Studd was a renowned English evangelist, died in the 1930s, but he said, too long we've been waiting for another to begin. <laughs> Would somebody else get us started? The time for waiting is past. Should, should such men as we fear before the whole world, a before the sleepy, lukewarm, faithless, namby-pamby Christian world, we will dare to trust our God and we will do it with his joy unspeakable, singing aloud in our hearts. We will a thousand times sooner die, trusting only in our God, than live, trusting in man. And when we come to this position, the battle is already won, and the end of the glorious campaign is in sight. We will have the real holiness of God. 
not the sticky stuff of talk and dainty words and pretty thoughts. We will have masculine holiness, one of daring faith and works for Jesus Christ. C.T. Studd kind of makes this out to be a male-female issue. I don't really think it's a, a gender issue. I think it's a weak, strong issue. And many times when we think of strength, we think of men. But he's talking here about a a strong faith, a daring faith. Hey, it's the only way to live. Second, it's the only way to serve. Now, what is keeping us from making an impact, a bigger impact? I think it's fear. I think it's hesitancy. William H. Murray led the Scottish Himalaya expedition in 1951. And he, he was credited with saying this, until one is committed There is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. I think of the children of Israel, you know, when the toes hit the water, the water opened up for them. God cooperated. He saw that they truly believed. They were committed. They were going through. And when they hit the water, boom, it opened for them. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issue from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, material assistance, which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, Begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. I love how it says in Ephesians chapter 2 that God saved us by grace through faith. Two good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has good works in mind for you to do. Some of you may be called to be a witness. But first, as Bill Hybel says, you got to walk across the room. Some of you may be called to walk on water, but first, as Peter said, you got to get out of the boat. I mean, you got to actually swing that first leg over. You got to say, God, I'm going. You've called me to this. I am moving forward. What God's calling you to do may be different than what He's calling me to do, but usually it involves some kind of intrepid faith to do it. Love how Larry Osborne said the most striking thing about highly effective leaders is how little they have in common. What one swears by, one swears against. But one trait stands out, the willingness to risk. You will never serve like you need to serve until you're willing to risk. And at the end of your life, I mean, you may have some regrets about what you've done. Your biggest regrets will be around what you have not done what's been left on the table. So is intrepid faith the best way to live? Intrepid faith is the best way to serve? Third, intrepid faith is the best way to please God. And I think this is the number one reason to, le- to live this way. I mean, certainly it's the best thing for you. Certainly the best thing for us as a church. But ultimately, the main reason I would say live your life intrepidly is because it's the best thing for him. Verse 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. What makes pleasing God possible? Intrepid faith. There's something about this that puts a smile on God's face when he sees us stepping out boldly, courageously, daringly. Man, it pleases him. And, And it's weird to think that something we would do here on earth would actually have an impact on him or affect him, but it does. When we trust him, when we follow him, when when we believe Him so much that we step out. I'd ask you, in what areas of your life do you need to be intrepid right now? Do you need to be committed? No more hesitancy. No more halfway. I'm going for it. You know, when you say that, a smile comes on God's face. He's like, that's what I'm looking for. That's what pleases me.
So verse 1 indicates that intrepid faith is needed particularly in two realms. It, it activates, first of all, in the realm of the future, but sure. Verse 1 says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. It hasn't happened yet, but we are sure now. When you look at the future, is it with hesitancy? Or are you bold as you head out into the future? Faith says, I'm certain. I am sure of what I'm hoping for. We don't know what the future holds. We know who holds the future. And because of that, we say, I'm confident. Are you bold and courageous as it relates to the future? And then second, faith is needed with the unseen but certain. Now, faith is being certain of what we do not see. Being sure of what we hope for, it operates in the realm of the future, but sure. And certain of what we do not see, it operates in the realm of the unseen, but certain. We cannot see it, but we are certain about it. Let me say this. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean that somebody else can't. I've been counseling some couples lately. I I, I think now is a particularly challenging time for marriages. It's it's financially challenging. It's stressful. And, um, you know, you you see this come in waves sometimes, you know. But one couple that I've spent quite a bit of time with, I had some very specific advice for. And I, I said to them, listen, you guys need to be living in two different places. Now, I I think there's something different about counseling somebody to separate with an eye towards divorce. What I was saying is, I think you need to separate with an eye towards reconciliation. In other words, we got to pull it apart to put it back together again. You guys need to work on your stuff. You need to get away from each other. I mean, sometimes when you're in the same space with somebody who's hurting you and you're, you're hurting them, To stay together is not the right thing. You're just hurting each other. And so that was the situation. I said, listen, I gave them a timeline. Here's how long. Here's what we'll do. Laid it all out. They didn't do it. I think the reason being they couldn't see it. They just couldn't see it. What? You're telling us to live in two different places, to do this work independently? Yeah, I am. I could see it. And what I needed them to do was trust me. They couldn't do it. They could not live unless they could see it. And and here's the way to live your life with God. Just do it. Just do it. That's what faith does. Faith says, God, I can't see it, but I'm going to do it. I I think of this in the area of tithing. Tithing is one of these areas where I I don't think I can see it. I mean, mean, okay, let me get this straight, God. You want me to return it tenth of what you've given to me for your work in the world and somehow this is going to work out better not just for you but for me I'm going to have 90% instead of 100% I tell you what some of us have done it and we can testify God makes good he does it but you know this is a faith thing you know I can't see this I'm just going to have to trust him I'm just going to have to do it I'm going to have to walk out boldly. I'm going to say, God, you said it. I'm doing it. Once you trust, then you understand. Verse 3 goes on to say, by faith we understand. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. We understand by faith that the ultimate reality is invisible. What was made, what we can see, came from what we cannot see. Just by word. We get it. I think it's so interesting that understanding doesn't lead to faith. Faith leads to understanding. By faith, we understand. And, and particularly in this area that's mentioned here in verse 3, this whole business about creation and, and maybe evolution. If you don't believe there's a God, then evolution makes perfect sense. And creationism is the ultimate absurdity. If you believe there is a God, evolution is the ultimate absurdity. Creation makes perfect sense, but the problem with believing in creation is not with the intellect, it's with the heart. In fact, I think when you open up the Bible, 
you get four words into it, and you got to make a choice. In the beginning, God. If you get that far into this book and you're still tracking, the rest of it's easy. I mean, the next word, created, okay. If there's a God, He can create. But you got to believe there's a God. Once you accept the ultimate miracle, all the other miracles are small. All the other ones are little. You know, scientists are having such a difficult time being evolutionists. You know, for instance, one of the things they're finding is that our galaxies are spinning at such a rapid rate. There's no good reason for them to stay together. I mean, you know how it is. If you spin something around, it wants to fly off. And, and things are moving out there in the universe so fast. They can't figure out what is holding this together. Why aren't planets and stars spinning off in every direction? There's too much velocity there. There's too much force. And so they came up with this idea. There's no reality behind this idea, but they came up with this idea called dark matter. That there must be some dark matter out there in the universe with sufficient magnetism to hold this thing together. Then they sent the Hubble telescope out, and the Hubble telescope was able to see out to the edge of our galaxy and, and realize our galaxy is expanding. So this thing's spinning, and it's moving out, and it's moving out at an accelerating pace, which doesn't make any sense. Okay, wait a second. We know that over time, things tend to slow down naturally. This thing's speeding up. So they came up with a second idea. Dark energy. We got dark matter kind of holding it together. We got dark energy kind of pushing it out. Oh, we're not sure how this all works. You know how it all works. In the beginning, God. That's how it works. I mean, once you accept that miracle... All the other miracles start to fall into place. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed. That word formed really means fit together, like a puzzle. Like there's a tremendous amount of mind behind this. And by faith, we get that. Now, beginning at verse 4, the Bible records for us two historic examples of intrepid faith. First, Abel, who was commended as a righteous man. Verse 4, by faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Abel, one of Adam and Eve's kids, is one of the first people. I mean, there's some great stories, great people that are going to be mentioned in this chapter. But we start, I think, in kind of an unlikely place. With Abel, and he says he was commended as a righteous man. Why? I think these two illustrations here are a commentary on verse 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Abel was certain of what he did not see. And the certainty was expressed in his offering. He could have brought vegetables. In fact, a case could be made that a better offering to God would have been vegetables. Cain, his brother, made that case. Verse 1 of, of Genesis 4, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks. Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Here's why Abel is commended as a righteous man. He followed instructions. God said, I want an animal sacrifice. You know what Abel did? Brought him an animal sacrifice. Couldn't see it. Didn't understand the significance. I mean, later, as you look through the Scripture, and you see what sacrifice means to the whole story of humanity. Christ himself being the Lamb of God who comes ultimately to take away the sins of the world. When you understand that he couldn't see any of that, 
He just did what he was told. That's faith. He believed in what he could not see. I think of men going out as naval officers, like my grandfather on a ship. You know, it's a great illustration in some ways. You climb on that ship, and at times, if you're not in the chain of command, if you're not up top, you don't know where you're going. You don't know where the ship's heading. In fact, you, you just wait for them to say, man your battle stations. And you just show up, and you start shooting. Why? You trust. You trust. Abel had that kind of faith. And then Enoch is mentioned in verse 5. He was commended as one who pleased God. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, so he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. The backstory on this in Genesis 5 is that Enoch lived 65 years. This is all we get on this man's story, by the way. It's very small. He became the father of Methuselah. Methuselah lived the longest of any recorded person in history, almost a thousand years. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. So most of the attention given to Enoch is just how long he lived. Then this statement, Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. And when we get to Hebrews, it says, Enoch pleased God. What did he do to please God? What, why was he taken away? I think because this also is a commentary on Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is being sure of what we hope for. I believe Enoch was so sure of his future. He was so heavenly minded. He was so confident in the world that was to come. I think God said, you know what? Let's skip the death part. Let me just take you there right now. And just translated him from one reality to the other. I think a person with intrepid faith has eternity in view. They're seeing heaven out on the horizon. And it affects what they're doing right now. Paul commented on this in Romans 8.18. He said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He goes, I see these present sufferings, but I see this too. I see where this thing's heading, and I'm not going to lose sight of that. You see this in Peter, who talks about tough times. 1 Peter 1.7, these have come so that your faith, these tough times have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Paul, Peter, you know, they're all looking forward. They're all sure of what they hope for. It's not just talk. It's action. I mean... They were willing to suffer. They were willing even to die. In fact, Paul was tortured and beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down. For that matter, nearly all of the apostles were martyred. Matthew, killed by a sword. Mark, drugged by horses through the streets until he died. Luke, hung to death in Greece. James, thrown off a building and then beat with a club. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded. Bartholomew was whipped to death. Andrew was strapped to a cross and left to die. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India. Jude was killed with arrows. Matthias was stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death. I mean, the early followers of Christ were killed about every which way a person could be killed, but they had this in common, intrepid faith. We believe. We trust. They believed in the future. They believed in the unseen. Let me ask you, are, are you looking to the future with trepidation or intrepidation? I mean, as you think about what's coming your way, are you nervous? Are you hesitant? Are you scared? Are you bold, courageous, and daring? See, God, I trust you. As you look at what you cannot see, I mean, right now, God's word to you, what God is telling you, you cannot see it, but will you say, I boldly trust it? 
That's God speaking. I will do it. You know, if you are sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see, not even the threat of death is a deterrent. In 1956, Jim Elliott was killed by Indians in Ecuador. He was a missionary. He was a jungle pilot. He went down to reach these people. These people didn't understand what he was doing there. He and three others were brutally massacred. It kind of set in motion a a huge movement of missionary activity in the U.S. These three men, their undaunted courage, you know, they're willing to go. Before any of that, though, Jim Elliott had penned this. He said, utterly ordinary. So commonplace. While we profess to know a power the 20th century cannot reckon with, we are all sideliners coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers while content to sit by and leave the enemies of God unchallenged. We are spiritual pacifists, conscientious objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in the heavenly places. The world cannot hate us. We are too much like its own. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. Amen. Let's bow for prayer.